Hello everyone, my name is Danielle Cunningham and I will be the trainer that is going to lead you through our Understanding PTSD training. So the objectives of this training is to um, be able to identify signs and symptoms with clients who experience PTSD, to increase knowledge of how to screen for PTSD when working with clients and their families, to become knowledgeable of the leading causes of PTSD and better intervene with clients who experience PTSD, um, to become familiar with the three R's of trauma and how to successfully get to resolution and healing, and to how to successfully help our clients cope with PTSD. So now we go into discussing what is PTSD. So post-traumatic stress disorder may develop when someone lives through or witnesses an event in which they believe there is a threat to life or physical integrity and safety and experiences fear, terror, or helplessness. Um, people with PTSD may relive the trauma and painful recollections, um, flashbacks, or recurrent dreams or nightmares. Um, they avoid activities or places that recall the traumatic event or experience psychological arousal, leading to symptoms such as an exaggerated startle response, disturbed sleep, difficulty in concentrating, or remembering and guilt about the surviving trauma when others did not. Um, so these stressful or traumatic events usually involve a situation when someone's life has been threatened or severe injury has occurred. Children and adults with PTSD may feel anxious or stressed even when they are not in um, present danger. So now we talk about the causes of PTSD. Now PTSD starts at different times for different people. Um, signs of PTSD may start soon after a frightening event and then continue on. Other people develop new or more severe signs months or even years later. PTSD is often related to seriousness of the trauma, whether the trauma was repeated or not, what the individual's proximity to the trauma was, and what their relationship is with the victim or perpetrator of that trauma. So to be considered for PTSD, signs and symptoms must last more than a month and be severe enough to interfere with school, work, or relationships. Um, PTSD can happen to anyone, um, even children. So here are some causes of PTSD. Um, so combat and military experience. So soldiers exposed to combat situations, war zones, or other dangerous military operations are at high risk of developing PTSD. Um, physical and sexual assault. Um, survivors of physical or sexual assault, including domestic violence or child abuse, may also develop PTSD. Um, then natural disasters. So individuals who have experienced or survived natural disasters, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, or wildfires, may develop PTSD. Um, some additional causes of PTSD can be childbirth complications. So some women may develop PTSD following difficult or traumatic childbirth experiences um, or childhood neglect or bullying. Um, individuals who experience significant neglect, emotional abuse or bullying during childhood may be at risk for developing PTSD later in life. So here are some additional causes of PTSD. So um, serious accidents. So people involved in severe accidents, um, such as car or plane crashes can also develop PTSD. Um, medical trauma. So patients who have undergone traumatic medical procedures, experience life-threatening illnesses, or face significant medical emergencies can develop PTSD. Um, witnessing violence, so people who have witnessed violence or a traumatic event, even if they were not directly involved, can also develop PTSD. Um, loss of a loved one, um, the sudden or unexpected loss of a loved one can lead to traumatic stress, particularly um, under distressing circumstances. And then lastly, first responders, um, so police officers, firefighters, um, emergency medical personnel um, are also people who can experience PTSD. So now we are going to discuss the four types of PTSD. And so those types are acute PTSD, chronic PTSD, delayed onset PTSD, and complex PTSD. So starting with acute PTSD, um, it is the most common type of PTSD and occurs within the first three months after a traumatic event. So symptoms of acute PTSD may include flashbacks, avoidance, or, um, or reminders of the trauma, 
an increased arousal, so difficulty sleeping, irritability, and hypervigilance. So this is also known as acute stress disorder. Um, it is a mental health problem that can occur in, within the first month after that traumatic event. Um, the symptoms of ASD are like PTSD symptoms, but you have them for longer than the month, then you will have them with PTSD. Um, ASD is diagnosed when someone has had direct or indirect exposure to a traumatic event and has experienced at least nine qualifying symptoms. So again, symptoms must continue for at least three days, but will resolve by the end of that first month. So some of those symptoms are reoccurring memories of the distressing event, nightmares um, related to the event, flashbacks of the event, a loss of memories related to the event, um, sleep disturbances, difficulty focusing, and trying to avoid reminders of that event. Um, some additional symptoms um, is to the attempt to avoid memories or feelings related to the event, um, experiencing intense stress after being reminded of that event, or distortions in the same in the sense of reality. So like the feeling that the time has slowed down, um, angry outbursts or irritability, um, hypervigilance, um, and even an elevated response to stimuli such as sudden movements or loud noises. So now we're going to discussing chronic PTSD. Um, chronic post-traumatic stress disorder is a severe anxiety disorder resulting from a traumatic event. Now, those who meet full ASD criteria have higher chances to develop chronic PTSD if they do not get the right treatment for their symptoms. So these examples um, of someone who has chronic PTSD um, include continuing domestic abuse, bullying, um, chronic medical illness with invasive medical procedures, homelessness, uh, neglect, starvation, um, ongoing war or combat, and witnessing constant abuse of a partner or family member. Chronic PTSD is a longer lasting form of the disorder that occurs when symptoms last for more than three months. Um, clients with chronic PTSD um, may have more severe persistent symptoms, including difficulty with relationships, work, and daily activities. So chronic trauma is repeated and prolonged, such as domestic violence or abuse. Now, the word chronic means referring to something that keeps recurring or has persisted over a long period of time. Chronic PTSD is an ongoing condition after a shocking or distressing event. Now, while it is not unusual to experience emotions like shock, fear, or increased anxiety after an upsetting event, these feelings usually lessen as time goes on. So with chronic PTSD, the ca it causes people to experience intense feelings over a long period of time. So again, some examples of that is some domestic abuse, bullying, neglect, ongoing war, and etc. So now we look at delay onset PTSD. Now delay onset PTSD occurs when symptoms do not appear until at least six months after the traumatic event. These types of PTSD can be more challenging to diagnose and treat because the delay in onset can make it difficult to link the symptoms to the traumatic event. Now, while sometimes referred to as delayed onset PTSD, the technical definition is PTSD with delayed expression. Now, PTSD is considered delayed um, even if, <clears throat> even if the symptoms do not appear for at least six months following a traumatic event. So in some cases, it can take years for a trauma response to develop. Now, with delayed onset PTSD, um, this type has mostly been observed among the elderly um, who may develop PTSD stemming from a traumatic event that occurred when they were much younger. So for example, one study of a World War II veteran found that many um, people had a worsening to their PTSD symptoms or the development of delayed onset PTSD much later in life. So almost half the veterans indicated that the worsening of their symptoms was triggered by major life changes, such as losing a job or a family member. 
So now we look at complex PTSD. Um, so complex PTSD um, is a mental health um, condition that can develop if you experience chronic long-term trauma. It involves stress responses such as anxiety, um, having flashbacks or nightmares, avoiding situations, places, and other things related to the traumatic event, heightened emotional responses, and a persistent difficulties in sustaining relationships. Um, complex PTSD is a type of PTSD that can occur after prolonged or repeated exposure to trauma such as abuse or captivity. Now, clients with complex PTSD may have a range of symptoms that, um, than those of other types of PTSD, but they may also have additional symptoms such as difficulty with self-perception, um, distorted beliefs um, about self or others, and problems with emotion regulation. So someone who has had complex PTSD has difficulty controlling their emotions, um, feeling very angry or distrustful towards the world, um, having that constant feeling of emptiness or hopelessness, or feeling as if they are permanently damaged because of that traumatic event. <clears throat> So some things here you want to note, um, it is important to note that not everyone who experiences a traumatic event will develop PTSD. Uh, many clients can cope with trauma and move on with their lives without experiencing long-term symptoms. However, for those who develop PTSD, treatment can be highly um, effective and help reduce and eliminate those symptoms. So now we talked about the different types of PTSD. Now we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms that are that relates to PTSD. So first here, um, this is a PTSD diagnostic criteria. Um, so to be diagnosed with PTSD, an adult child um, must have all of the following for at least once a month. So according to the DSM-5, the diagnostic criteria for PTSD include the following. So criteria A is the stressor. Um, so you directly have experienced or have exposure to that event. Um, you have had exposure of threat of death, serious injury, or sexual violence. Um, so an example of that is that you witnessed the event happen to someone else or you have witnessed or experienced that um, event yourself. Um, the second criteria there is intrusion. Um, this is the traumatic event is persistently re-experienced, so example as in nightmares or flashbacks. Um, so traumatic nightmares or upsetting dreams with content related to the event. Um, children may have frightening dreams without content um, related to that trauma, okay? Um, criterion C is that avoidance, um, so persistent, um, effortful avoidance of distressing trauma-related reminders after that event. So the avoidance of trauma-related external reminders such as people, places, conversations, activities, objects, or situations, okay? Um, criterion D is the negative alterations in mood. Um, so negative alterations in condition and mood that begin or worsen after the traumatic event. So an example of that is the inability to, inability to recall key features of that traumatic event. Now this is usually disassociative amnesia, um, not, to, not due to head injury, alcohol, or drugs. Um, criterion E is the alterations in arousal and reactivity. Um, so trauma-related alterations in arousal and reactivity that begin or worsen after that traumatic event. So becoming very irritable or um, having some increased ag aggressive behavior. Um, criterion F is the duration. Um, so you need to have persistence of symptoms in criterion B, C, and D, and E for more than one month. Um, next is going to be um, criterion G, which is functional significance, so significant symptom-related distress or impairment of different areas of life, such as social or occupational. Um, then criterion H is exclusion. This is the disturbance, um, but it is not due to medication, substance use, or any other illnesses. So before someone um, can be diagnosed with PTSD, they need to have at least one of these following um, for at least a month. 
So according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder is characterized by four major symptom clusters following an event that elicit fear, helplessness, or horror. So the four main symptoms of PTSD um, is re-experiencing, avoidance, hyperarousal, and alterations in thought and mood. And so in our next couple slides, we're going to break these down a little bit and go into a little bit more detail of each. So here is a video that is going to explain those four main symptoms of PTSD, re-experiencing hyperarousal, avoidance, and alterations. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, is a mental health disorder that results from experiencing a traumatic event. This includes any event that is experienced personally, witnessed, or learned about that causes feelings of extreme fear, helplessness, or horror. Examples include experiencing a natural disaster, a serious accident, war, rape, or other violent personal assaults. It is not uncommon for one to experience a trauma, According to the National Center for PTSD, about 60% of men and 50% of women experience at least one incidence of trauma in their lives. Nearly everyone who experiences a traumatic event will have temporary difficulty adjusting and coping and may experience PTSD symptoms for a period of time. However, over time, a process of recovery occurs naturally and PTSD symptoms resolve on their own. For others, however, the symptoms persist and become interfering and distressing. PTSD is diagnosed when the symptoms last for at least one month. The symptoms are organized into four clusters. While I'll discuss the different clusters briefly, it's also important to understand how they might look all together as they reinforce each other to maintain PTSD over time. The first cluster involves re-experiencing the trauma in any of several ways. One way is through memories that intrude on someone in an unwanted way, coming to someone's mind when they don't want them to. Sometimes these memories are experienced so vividly that the person experiences a reliving of the trauma, that is, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, or feeling the same sensations they did during the traumatic experience. This is called a flashback. This is very different from thinking or ruminating about something. Another way is through experiencing nightmares or by having intense emotional or physical reactions when somebody is reminded of their trauma. Since these symptoms can be quite distressing, when they are repeatedly experienced, an understandable reaction to them is to try to avoid them. People might try to avoid the memories by pushing them away, not talking about them, or keeping busy to distract themselves from them. They may avoid the emotions associated with the trauma by shutting down, meaning they try not to feel any emotions. They may also try to avoid reminders, such as people, places, or situations that remind them of their traumatic event. It is important to understand that avoidance is an understandable strategy to help manage symptoms, and it might work in the short term. However, over time, it actually prevents one from recovering. For example, the more one tries to push memories away, the more they will intrude on their mind and the less control they'll have over the memories. Let's take an example. I'd like you to think about anything right now, anything at all, except for a dancing panda bear. Think about anything at all except for that bear. What do you notice? Likely you're thinking about the bear, or at least trying really hard not to think about the bear, which is making it difficult to think about anything else. In PTSD, as avoidance strategies become less effective over time, one might increase their use to continue to try to manage symptoms. Unfortunately, many of these avoidance strategies, like withdrawing from people, using substances, being aggressive, become problems in their own right that worsen over time. A third cluster of symptoms concerns negative changes in thoughts and mood. After experiencing a trauma, one might develop negative beliefs about themselves, such as, I am a bad person, or it is my fault that it happened. Negative beliefs about other people, such as nobody can be trusted, or negative beliefs about the world, such as the world is dangerous. When someone avoids social contact and other situations, these beliefs tend to become stronger and they lead to persistent negative emotions, such as fear, shame, guilt, anger, or sadness. The last cluster of symptoms are called hyperarousal symptoms. These include hypervigilance, in which one feels constantly on guard and watchful, irritability or anger outbursts, difficulty sleeping, 
difficulty concentrating, having an exaggerated startle response, and participation in unhealthy or risky behaviors. As I said earlier, it is helpful to understand how these different clusters of symptoms interact and reinforce one another. For example, if someone is experiencing painful intrusive memories about a trauma, they may begin to avoid the memories and emotions associated with the trauma. This in turn leads to feelings of emotional detachment that cause the memories to intrude even more. To try to reduce being triggered by reminders, one might start to avoid certain places or things, such as crowded areas or dark rooms. The more one avoids contact with their environment, the stronger their negative beliefs about themselves, such as I can't handle it, and their beliefs about the world, such as if I go out, something bad will happen. The stronger those beliefs become, and the more intense their negative mood becomes. So now we talk about re-experiencing. So re-experiencing PTSD is feeling like you are reliving the event through flashbacks, dreams, or intrusive thoughts. Flashbacks, nightmares, and bad memories are examples of re-experiencing symptoms. Um, these symptoms, particularly flashbacks, can also have physical effects such as rapid heartbeats or sweating. So some clients have constant negative thoughts about their experience, repeatedly asking themselves questions that prevent them from coming to terms with the event. So re-experiencing involves having sudden and unwanted traumatic memories that intrude into or even seem to replace what is happening now. So re-traumatization is reliving stress reactions experienced because of a traumatic event when faced with a um, new or similar incident. So looking at avoidance, avoidance is one of the most common symptoms of PTSD. It can significantly affect your quality of life. So it is common to want to avoid things that remind you of a traumatic event, but avoiding thoughts and feelings can make it um, hard to recover. Avoidance can seem like a helpful behavior to people living with PTSD because it allows them to avoid uncom uncomfortable or distressing emotions or sensations. So emotional avoidance is another type of avoidance. Um, this is when a person avoids thoughts or feelings about the traumatic event. Um, this type of avoidance is um, internal to the person. Others around you may not know what you are avoiding and why. Avoided reminders like places, people, sounds, or smells of a trauma is called behavioral um, avoidance. So for example, assault um, survivors may go out of their way to stay away from the scene of their attack or places that reminded them of that assault. Also, for a hurricane survivor, um, they, for emotional avoidance, they may drink alcohol or use substances to try to avoid thoughts or memories of that natural disaster. So here are some consequences of avoidance. Um, if you go through a trauma, you may have heard advice like um, just try not to think about it or time heals all wounds. But if you go out of your way to avoid thoughts, feelings, and reminders related to a traumatic event, your symptoms may get worse. So using avoidance um, as your main way of coping with the traumatic memories can make PTSD symptoms worse and make it harder um, to move on with your life. Um, so now we look into hyperarousal. Um, hyperarousal is a pervasive mood and life-altering symptom in which you are persistently irritable, angry, and paranoid. Um, hyperarousal is the abnormally heightened state of anxiety that occurs whenever you think about the traumatic event. Even though the threat may no longer be present, your body will respond as if it is. Now here are some symptoms of hyperarousal, uh, and they can be characterized by pervasive jittery feelings, always being on the lookout, um, general irritability, becoming angry, um, getting startled by loud noises, difficulty sleeping, um, the inability to concentrate and focus on one thing, and then that paranoia. Now we look at alterations in thought and mood. Um, so these negative thoughts or feelings that begin or worsened after the trauma. Um, and it, this is an inability to recall key features of that trauma, overlie negative thoughts and assumptions about oneself or the world. Having that exaggerated blame um, of self or others that is causing the trauma. 
So looking at the cognition and mood symptoms as it relates to PTSD, um, cognition and mood symptoms can begin or worsen after a traumatic event. Um, they can also lead a person to feel detached from family um, or friends. So having trouble remembering key features of the traumatic event, um, having negative thoughts about oneself or the world, having exaggerated feelings of blame directed towards oneself or others, Having ongoing negative emotions such as fear, anger, guilt, or shame. Um, losing interest in enjoyable activities. Having feelings of social isolation. And having difficulty feeling positive emotions such as happiness or satisfaction. So is trauma a subjective or um, objective experience? So the traumatic experience can be divided into two components, um, objective and subjective. The objective are the events in the trauma, and then the subjective is how the individual experiences those events. So a car accident resulting in minimal injuries can leave one person getting up the next day, being able to get into a vehicle, and even drive themselves home or driving themselves home from the hospital. Whereas another person can be in the same car accident and may not want to get into a car for weeks, months. And so this is why it is impossible to know what constitutes a traumatic youth experience for every person because it is different for everybody. So some objective characteristics are those elements of the traumatic event that are tangible or factual. Um, subjective characteristics include internal processes such as perceptions of the traumatic experience and meanings assigned to them. So trauma is subjective by nature. Um, it is not always the circumstances of an event that determines whether it is traumatic for a person. Instead, it is important to look at the subjective emotional experiences a person had in that moment. So trauma is subjective. So why does PTSD develop and how can we help with someone cope with PTSD? So why does PTSD develop? Um, although it is not clear exactly why people develop PTSD, several possible reasons have been suggested. So one, there is a survival mechanism, high adrenaline levels, and changes in the brain. So if you had depression or anxiety in the past and you do not receive much support from family or friends, you may be more likely to develop PTSD after a traumatic event. Um, there may also be a genetic factor involved in PTSD. So for example, um, having a parent with a mental health problem um, is thought to increase your chances of developing the condition. Um, but we're going to review each of these in the next upcoming slides and talk a little bit more in depth about each of these. So looking at the survival mechanism, so one suggestion is that the symptoms of PTSD are the results of an indistinctive mechanism intended to help you survive further traumatic experiences. So for example, the flashbacks many people with PTSD experience may force you to think about the event in detail so you're better prepared if it happens again. Um, the feeling of being on edge or having that hyperarousal may develop to help you react quickly to another crisis. Now looking at high adrenaline, so this reaction, often known as the fight or flight reactions, helps to descend the sense of dull pain. Um, so people with PTSD have been found to continue to produce high amounts of fight or flight hormones, even when there is no danger. So it's the thought that may be responsible for the numbed emotions and hyperarousal experienced by some people with PTSD. So now we look at changes in the brain. Um, so one part of the brain's responsible for memory and emotions is known as the hippocampus. Um, in people with PTSD, the hippocampus appears smaller in size. Um, it's thought that changes in the part um, of the brain may be related to fear and anxiety, memory problems, and flashbacks. Um, the malfunctioning hippocampus um, may prevent flashbacks and nightmares being properly processed. Um, so the anxiety they gen that generates does not reduce over time. So this is an image of a brain of an adult who has experienced PTSD and then an image of an adult who has not experienced PTSD. OK, um, so trauma affects the brain, especially the prefrontal cortex, amygdala and hippocampus. Uh, when there is a potential threat, the amygdala sends an instant message to the hippocampus, activating the automatic nervous system. 
Um, the ANS, which is the Automatic Nervous System, is the unconscious system that regulates bodily functions such as digestion, respiration, and heart rate. Um, so if we need to run fast, the system will get us ready quickly. And so the amygdala also relists cortisol and adrenaline, um, hormones that prepare us for fight or flight. So once the threat is gone, the body returns to its normal um, state. However, if there's a problem with the system, um, there could still be arousal and the person uh, will feel their heart rate elevate, increased breathing and general unrest as a result of the activation of the flight or flight system. But in PTSD, it is very difficult to activate the prefrontal cortex to help calm the whole system down with logical and soothing thoughts and feelings. OK, so trauma does affect the brain. So here are some do's and what we can do as a provider when helping someone experience PTSD. Um, so one, we want to stay calm and patient. Um, it is important to remain calm and patient during a PTSD episode. Um, listen actively. Um, listen carefully to what the person is saying and try to understand their perspective. Um, create a safe environment, so removing any triggers that may cause distress, such as loud noises, um, bright lights, and if possible, move to a quiet, safe location where the person can feel more um, secure. Um, you can also offer social support. Um, let the person know that they are not alone. Um, offer to stay with them or call a trusted friend or family member, but just provide that additional support um, to your client or anyone who is experiencing PTSD. Now, some don'ts, some things we don't want to do when we are helping someone experience PTSD um, is you want to avoid getting angry or frustrated, as this can make the situation worse. Um, speak in a calm and reassuring tone of voice. Um, avoid interrupting or dismissing their feelings. Um, acknowledge their emotions and let them know that you are here to support them. Okay. <clears throat> So here is another video of how we can help someone experience um, who is experiencing PTSD. Hey, Psych2Goers, welcome back and thanks so much for your support. If you're new to this channel and by the end of the video you enjoy our content, do consider subscribing and joining the Psych2Go fam. Now, let's continue. Did you know that 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives? According to the APA, Trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event, like an accident or natural disaster. However, while many videos tend to focus on the person who experienced the traumatic event, today we will be focusing on the people who support them. It can be difficult and sometimes uncomfortable to know what you should or shouldn't say to someone with trauma, and whether it is actually helpful or not. So, to help you out, here are 15 things to say to someone with trauma. Number one, I see you're in pain. It's okay to feel this way. Someone who has experienced trauma has witnessed something that we probably would have never even imagined. And some may beat themselves up for having endured the trauma or get angry at themselves for being so upset. By acknowledging their pain, you're showing them that it isn't all in their head. It's a way to tell them that their feelings are valid. Number two, your symptoms make sense given what you've been through. In response to the indescribable pain they're in, Sometimes people with trauma can experience uncontrollable emotional breakdowns. Because of this, they may tell themselves that they're broken, weird, or hopeless. So by saying that their symptoms make sense, you can provide them a sense of understanding and reassurance. It tells them that their trauma was real and is something that they're healing from. Number three, what has happened doesn't define you. People who have survived trauma sometimes get labeled as the victim, even after what has happened. This may even apply to the person who's gone through the trauma, where they ended up allowing what had happened to be part of who they are. While what they've gone through may have been difficult and perhaps life-changing, reminding them that they are not defined by their trauma can give them a sense of reassurance. You can remind them that they're much more than their trauma and that they are beautiful, strong, and courageous. Number four, the worst isn't happening again, even though it may feel that way. A possible side effect that can happen when you've gone through something traumatic is the experience of flashbacks. This can make it feel as though the trauma is occurring all over again. They may experience intrusive thoughts, images, and sensations from the event that they can't block out, making it hard for them to focus and function normally. In cases like this, you can help them by reminding them about their present surroundings. Number five, you didn't deserve that. 
sometimes people with trauma develop a very negative and harmful mindset where they might believe they somehow deserved what had happened. So by vocalizing that that is not the case, you can reassure them that it wasn't their fault and pull them out of their toxic thoughts. Number six, how can I help? Everyone deals with their trauma differently. Some may find your kind words to be uncomfortable and unhelpful. So when you ask them how you can help them, you're showing them that you respect their boundaries and space and are giving them the freedom to decide what kind of help they would like to receive. Number seven, what happened to you was never your fault. People who've experienced trauma will often blame themselves for the fallout of what happened. This is especially the case if there was someone injured or hurt due to the incident. Even if it wasn't in their control, they may still ruminate over their guilt. So by reassuring them that it wasn't their fault, you can help pull them out of their negative and harmful thoughts. Number eight, I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. I will do my best to be there and to never judge. A traumatic event that involves trusting the wrong people can cause someone to develop trust issues afterwards. They may start to doubt or worry about being betrayed or hurt by their friends or family. In cases like these, you can try to show more understanding and patience with them until they can start to open up to you again. Number nine, it's okay to be hurt and angry. These feelings don't make you a bad person. After a trauma, it's not unusual for the survivors to begin to see themselves in some way as being less than others. Perhaps they may see themselves as weak for allowing it to happen. As with many beliefs related to trauma, survivors are sometimes more critical of themselves than they need to be. Telling them that they are strong and not weak is a way in which you can reassure them and help them feel better about themselves. Number 10, I don't understand the signs and symptoms, but I believe you and I support you. It's hard and almost impossible to know what someone with trauma is going through, but it doesn't mean you can't give your support for them while they're healing. By vocalizing this point, you can help encourage them in their progress to getting better. Number 11, you are inspiring, even if you don't see it. The growth you've made is remarkable. It takes a lot to recover from the trauma and the survivor may not always see the progress that they've made. So try to find ways to acknowledge their efforts and remind them that they are making progress every day and that even if they don't see it, you do. Number 12, you're not alone no matter how much it feels like it. The feeling of isolation can become overwhelming after a traumatic experience because no one else has experienced the same exact event as them. They may feel like no one can understand how they feel. So during moments where they feel this way, you can try to provide them with some company, listen to them and reassure them that they are not alone. Number 13, you are loved and cherished. Survivors of a traumatic event sometimes come out of what they've experienced feeling anxious, depressed, guilty, or even ashamed. These feelings can feed into toxic thoughts that harm their self-esteem and make them feel unloved. So try to remind them that they are loved, cherished, and appreciated, despite how they must be feeling about themselves. Number 14, I have been here before. Just know that I'm here for you and you can get better. If you share a similar experience with them, it's still important to let them share with you what they want to share. Talking about their traumatic experiences can be challenging and tough, so it's key that you're able to show your care and support for them when they do. If you feel the need to talk as a fellow survivor, you can consider inviting them to a group therapy or a group discussion, or to simply revisit the conversation later on. And number 15, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I will be keeping you in my thoughts and prayers. If you don't have a close relationship with a survivor or do not wish to play an active role in their ongoing healing process, you can say something that is comforting to them and leave it at that. It's important here that you say what you mean because you may end up hurting them even more if you make a promise you can't keep. What do you say to comfort your loved ones? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with those who may benefit from it. And don't forget to hit the notification so how to help someone cope with PTSD? Um, your care and support after a traumatic event may make a big difference in how well and how fast the traumatized person recovers.
Um, so understand the definition of a traumatic event. Um, you can also identify some of the signs um, and then are willing to keep offering help even if it's not accepted at first. Um, but also educate yourself. People who struggle with PTSD often do so in isolation, um, finding it hard to reach out. So by learning about the condition, you have the words to more clearly explain to others what is happening for your client and ask for what they need. So here are some additional strategies that can be considered when um, helping someone who is experiencing PTSD. So seek professional treatment and consider therapy, medication, and lifestyle changes along the way to help with symptoms related to PTSD. Build an effective support system that includes people who can support you through this journey, such as your mental health providers, psychiatrists, family, and friends. Avoid using substances and other negative coping strategies to help self-soothe or self-medicate. Um, get enough rest, at least eight hours of sleep at night, and decrease caffeine intake. Um, so people who are diagnosed with PTSD can live fulfilling lives. However, it is imperative to seek out professional treatment. Every person is different when dealing with PTSD, so everyone's management strategies will vary. All right, so some additional strategies um, here is to practice self-care techniques when feeling overwhelmed. Um, identify triggers that may cause stress and develop emotion regulation techniques. Um, practice relaxation techniques. Um, eat a balanced diet. Incorporate exercise into your everyday routine. Um, practice reframing negative thoughts as they come up. Um, people who are diagnosed with PTSD can live fulfilling lives. However, it is imperative to seek out professional treatment. Um, every person is different when dealing with PTSD, so everyone's management strategies may vary. So here are some additional coping strategies to help someone who is experiencing PTSD. Um, so learning healthy coping strategies for PTSD um, can offer a sense of renewal, hope, and control over your life. So some examples here um, is mindfulness, uh, which helps us relax our body and calm our mind by bringing our awareness into the present moment without any judgment. Uh, Mindfulness-based interventions are often incorporated into therapy to facilitate better coping with PTSD flashbacks. So using mindfulness-based strategies for coping with PTSD has been specifically related to lower levels of substance abuse and PTSD. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, numerous studies have found physical exercise to be associated with decreased symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. So going to the gym, doing a cardio routine, or even a simple 10-minute walk can significantly help alleviate symptoms um, such as low mood. Um, writing allows you to freely express your thoughts and emotions and have been indicated in the improvement of mental and emotional well-being. Um, so just here are just some additional ones here for you to help your clients or either yourself. Um, cope with um, PTSD. Continuing on with some coping strategies for PTSD, um, one of the most important ways to cope with PTSD and many other conditions is to take care of your mental and physical wellness. Um, so there are many strategies that can work together with your treatment to not only help you cope with PTSD, but to strengthen your mind and body in ways that can benefit you in your everyday life. Um, here are some additional coping strategies um, for PTSD. Um, so follow a healthy lifestyle, eating a balanced diet and maintaining good sleep hygiene. Um, try to avoid smoking, um, drinking coffee, alcohol, and any other illegal drugs. Um, socialize with your friends and family. Um, talk to a trusted friend and family member openly and honestly. Um, engage in self-care practices like getting a massage or going to the spa. Um, set small and realistic goals for yourself and do things that you enjoy, like eating good food, listening to relaxing music, or pursuing a hobby. So here's a video where Ms. Mary is going to discuss um, successful trauma resolution, where she's going to mention the three R's, reenact, re-experiencing, and releasing. So now I get to talk with you about the three R's of successful trauma resolution. The first R is re-experiencing. The second R is releasing. And the third R is reorganizing. But before we get onto the path of the three R's of successful trauma resolution, we have to look at where we meet the people we serve because they're not on the path yet. They're still caught in yet another R called reenactment. 
And the important part of that word is the act. It is the reenactment that causes the acting out behaviors, as they're often labeled, that bring people to our door. And what their brain literally is doing is reliving the trauma in the present moment without their thinking brain knowing it. And this reenactment is not a choice. It comes from the part of the brain we don't have conscious control over. And it feels like the trauma is happening all over again. It's a very lonely, frightening place to be. And when they're done, it may look like they have gotten some relief, but they have not. That person is caught in the trauma of the past and reliving it in the present moment. They don't feel safe. They are just as frightened now as they were when the trauma happened. And it's not a choice. It's not a relief. And it's something we actually can help them move beyond. Where tr the three R's of trauma resolution comes in is that the first one we experiencing can happen depending on how we react to someone's reenactment. If we reflect the fear that we see and we honor that they had the courage to show us that fear and we connect them with the fact that they're safe and in the here and now right now we literally allow that person to re-experience that trauma not from a place of being alone but from a place of connection so when you get to re-experience that trauma with a safe other whether it's through drawing or writing the person no longer feels alone in that moment and it literally takes them off their hamster wheel of reenactment. You have helped heal their brain. So the second R is when we honor what they've done to survive, and that allows their brain to release their trauma from the central nervous system and put it in the memory center of the brain where it belongs. We are helping their brain release their trauma, and we're also giving them dignity for the survival they have already done that has gone unrecognized. And then the third R is my favorite, because once you've released it, you are aware that the trauma has happened, but it is no longer the central organizing feature of your life. Then all the energy your brain was taking up, keeping you in the past and looking out for the future and not allowing you to live in your present moment is freed up for you to decide what you want for your present and your future. You literally now can connect with people, feel safe enough to reorganize your life around what you want your life to be. So here are some keys to providing trauma-informed care. So we need to presume that our clients have experienced trauma. So instead of what is wrong with you, um, maybe asking what has happened to you. Um, the need for an understanding of the vulnerabilities or triggers of survivors to provide supportive care and avoid re-traumatization. So when we look at re-traumatization, um, this happens when we are recovering from PTSD um, or a sufferer is exposed to people, incidents, or environments um, that cause them to relive that previous trauma, almost as if it was occurring again. Um, Retraumatization happens when people with PTSD are exposed to those specific people, places, and events that has caused them to re-experience that past trauma. Um, also, survivors need to be respected, informed, connected, and hopeful regarding their own recovery. Um, understand that there is a correlation between trauma and symptoms of trauma, so like substance abuse, eating disorders, depression, and anxiety. So some additional keys to pro um, providing trauma-informed care is to one, set up a calming um, and nurturing environment. So you want your client to be comfortable, um, be conscious of the person's demeanor. So if someone is beginning to move from a calm, continuous state to a state of emergency, if so, model caring and um, compassion and adjust the environment if possible. Um, be aware of language being used, so using um, a diagnosis when referring to an individual. So here are some approaches to providing trauma-informed care. Um, use trauma lens. Assume that a client's trauma may have contributed to current medical conditions. Um, using the trauma-informed approach and offering serves to heal from past trauma along with traditional medical therapies may lead to better outcomes and experiences of care. Um, these two can be considered markers and include being reactive, easily triggered, easily offended, or angered, 
withdrawn or disassociated. So some other factors to consider, um, it is important to acknowledge that many providers and staff themselves have histories of trauma. Um, working with patients with such severe illnesses and such significant histories of trauma can cause vicarious. And so that is experienced in imagination, through feelings or actions of another person. Um, conscious awareness of our own traumas help us maintain a professional and therapeutic stance towards our patients with trauma. Um, we can use guidelines for inquiring about trauma and past trauma, which are known to be less triggering or dangerous for our patients and less overwhelming for providers. So that is all for today. Um, we want to say thank you for taking our training here on understanding trauma. Um, we do have a small survey that we would like you to complete regarding your training experience here. Um, so you can either scan the QR code or you can utilize the um, link there. Um, put that full browser into your URL and let us know how you have liked this training today.